Um, so we will be discussing today about some important recent research, uh, which is important for the um, your fellowship exam and also for understanding how research has influenced our clinical practice. So this I shall try and discuss under different uh, areas in uh, neonatology, starting from the birth of the preterm baby, um, the neonatal resuscitation domain, followed by respiratory support and newer concepts in the prevention and treatment of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, we shall also be discussing about um, uh, newer advances in NEC and enteral feeding. And lastly, uh, we will cover PDA, ROP, uh, perinatology, where we shall be discussing about uh, the um, newer concepts in preventing uh, prematurity. This is mainly from the antenatal antepartum perspective, neuroprotection, and some miscellaneous areas. So I'll begin with resuscitation. Um, so again, there are multiple domains uh, in resuscitation where newer advances have come. Uh, starting from the um, the management of um, uh, a newborn who is born through meconium stain lyca. Then we have recent changes in cord management where delayed cord clamping and uh, um, cord milking has been propagated. We know the importance of early skin-to-skin -skin contact. And um, we also have newer changes in the assessment of babies where heart rate is being assessed with ECG or with a pulse oximeter over a stethoscope and in the thermal management, particularly in preterm neonates born below 32 weeks, where the use of polyethylene wrap, use of heated humidified gases during resuscitation and the use of uh, stockinet cap and um, mattresses, uh, heat exothermic mattresses are all being used as a bundle for hypothermia prevention. So we shall discuss about some aspects of the uh, management of a newborn born through meconium stain lyca. So here, uh, traditionally, um, the, uh, the management of a baby born through MSL used to include amnioinfusion for diluting the meconium. Um, later, um, there, was, uh, there was a practice of doing routine oropharyngeal suction when the baby was born and this used to be done at the time of shoulder delivery itself. The, the use of tracheal suctioning both in vigorous as well as non-vigorous neonates was also a, um, a policy or a frequent uh, or a regular clinical practice. Now uh, over the years a lot of these practices have been removed with, um, with understanding or with newer evidence coming in. So amnioinfusion, there were uh, studies that showed that in centers where there is good antepartum, intrapartum monitoring, amnioinfusion doesn't reduce the incidence of meconium aspiration syndrome, birth asphyxia, or mortality. The uh, routine oropharyngeal suction at the time of shoulder delivery um, again uh, became um, a practice which was no longer recommended after this study, which came up in Lancet 2004, Vein et al., so as you can see here in the graph on the right side and um, uh, some of these slides, I thank Dr. Deepak Chabla, sir, um, for, uh, uh, for sharing his slides with me. So you can see that there are uh, two pharyngeal suctioning versus no oropharyngeal suctioning. It is 4% in both these arms. So it is comparable. So if doing oropharyngeal suctioning doesn't really reduce the incidence of meconium aspiration syndrome. Um, however, in the uh, red columns, the red columns, both in the suction arm as well as no oropharyngeal suction, the incidence of MAS is 28 and 25%. It is almost the same and it is almost seven times higher than in the overall group of babies. So what this means is, Oropharyngeal suctioning doesn't really change the incidence of meconium aspiration syndrome. However, if the baby is born non-vigorous, that is if abgars are less, less than five, and if the baby is born depressed, so non-vigorous newborn uh, in, indicates a baby who is born with a heart rate less than 100 per minute or without good respiratory efforts or with poor tone. So if this is there, automatically the incidence of meconium aspiration is higher. So this shows that most of the meconium aspiration happens intrapartum and not postpartum. 
So the regular use of oropharyngeal suctioning in, um, uh, in babies born through meconium stain amniotic fluid uh, went away with this practice. Then um, people continued to do endotracheal suctioning after the baby was born, if the baby was born through MSAF. Again, uh, there were multiple small RCTs that looked into tracheal suctioning after birth in the vigorous newborns first. So initially, we did not have the confidence to um, analyze the role of tracheal suctioning in non-vigorous newborns because these babies were born depressed and it was traditionally thought that removing meconium from the trachea was important part of resuscitation. So studies first started coming up in vigorous units born through MSL. So if baby had heart rate more than 100 per minute with good respiratory effort and good muscle tone, did these babies still require tracheal suctioning? So this was analyzed. And here, although this is not a very recent study, just for the sake of completion, I wanted to show the study by Viswil et al. You can see the fourth RCT here that included nearly 2,000 newborn babies. So the diamond um, uh, representing the relative risk shows that there was no difference between the group of babies who required tracheal suctioning versus no tracheal suctioning. So, which means that there was no incidence of MAS whether or not we did tracheal suctioning among vigorous neonates. So this is how evidence evolved. So first, amnio infusion, it was shown that there was no benefit. However, there may still be some role in areas where fetal surveillance is not readily available or not adequately done. So if there is poor intrapartum monitoring, there may still be a small role for amnio infusion. Then we saw that from the RCT of Wayne and his colleagues, regular intrapartum oropharyngeal suctioning, that is soon after the baby's birth, oropharyngeal suctioning did not have any benefit in preventing MAS because most of the time meconium aspiration had happened in utero. Then post-delivery endotracheal suctioning of vigorous newborns was shown to have no benefit from the RCT of Viswell along with three other small randomized controlled trials. It still remained a question whether tracheal suctioning was advocated in non-vigorous units. So here, um, evidence came from four randomized controlled trials, all of which were from India. Um, so Sushma Nangya ma'am has a lot of work in this area. So one of the studies came from ma'am's unit in Lady Harding Medical College, and the other centers also were all from India. So these studies, if you look at the combined relative risk, which is this diamond at the, uh, at the end, you can see that it directly lies on the line of no difference. So relative risk is 1.0 and the confidence intervals are 0 0.8 to 1.25. So you know that if the 95% confidence intervals cross one, this intervention has no benefit. So endotracheal suctioning in non-vigorous newborns born through meconium stain liquor was shown to have no benefit in reducing meconium aspiration syndrome. However, these are all small studies. You can see that the number of um, babies in each arm in Chetri et al, it is 61 and 61. In um, uh, Sushma Nangya ma'am study, it is 87 and 88 babies in the two arms respectively. So these are all not very large studies. And because most of this group, meconium stain liquor as, as a problem, may be more commonly seen in low middle income countries. So we don't expect or anticipate large RCTs coming from this domain from the Western literature. So unless we have a large, one more large RCT from India, perhaps, this may remain the uh, evidence for now. So at present, if the baby is born through meconium stain liquor, essentially our management is not different from a baby who is born through clear liquor. Uh, another important study for you all to know, for us all to know, is this SAIL study, which was the um, RCT that compared the use of sustained inflations versus standard resuscitation in preterm units. So SAIL study uh, um, was uh, a large multi-center RCT. It was uh, published in uh, 2019 in JAMA. So this study, again, it, it looked at the intervention of sustained inflation which is providing two to three high pressure, um, positive pressure breaths for with a long eye time. So we provide increased peak pressure as well as lo very long eye time. So peak pressures may go up to 25, 30 or 35 centimeters of water along with prolonged eye time in an attempt to 
establish functional residual capacity in preterm units. So this intervention, it was shown in animal data to be very encouraging and even preliminary uh, human studies also showed that this intervention may result in reduction in need of surfactant, ventilation and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So there was a lot of interest in sustained inflation. Then sales study got published in 2019 by Harish Kriplani uh, and his team. This was a multicentric randomized controlled trial. So you can see the study flow here, 460 preterm infants were randomized. Um, surprisingly, in this RCT, the sustained inflation group, so there were 215 infants in the sustained inflation group. You can see the forest, the, the outcome table graph on the right side, 215 in sustained inflation and 211 in the standard resuscitation arm. And if you see the fourth arm here, indicating the column on death, the table, the, the row shows that there is 7.4% incidence of death in sustained inflation group versus 1.4% in the standard resuscitation group. So there is almost 5.6 times increase in the risk of mortality with sustained inflation. Why this happened um, was not very clear, but possible reasons were because of high pressure, barotrauma and volute trauma, and possibly sustained inflations could have um, resulted in decreased venous return and cardiac output. So due to all these reasons, um, it did not really work well. So you can see here the, um, the you can see that 95% confidence interval of the uh, relative risk is completely on this side of one, indicating that there was significant increase in mortality with sustained inflations, inflations. So SAIL is another important uh, RCT in the resuscitation domain. Next, we move on to delayed cord clamping, cord management. So here, we all know that the upcoming uh, concept is that of delay in cord clamping by at least 30 to 120 seconds. So earlier, we used to do immediate cord clamping. Now, the current concept is the NRP and ILCOR, WHO as well, all bodies are recommending delayed cord clamping, wherein we wait for a minimum of 60 seconds for clamping the umbilical cord. Of course, this has been delayed until maximum of 180 seconds. Now, what were all the benefits of delayed cord clamping? It improves the placentofetal circulation by an additional 20 to 30 ml per kg. So this additional blood volume may confer a lot of benefits to the baby. So especially in the first minute, this additional transfusion of uh, 20 to 30 ml per kilogram of the baby's body weight can result in lesser need for blood transfusions by 40%, lesser incidence of IVH, lesser incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis in preterm babies and greater hemodynamic stability and need for inotropes. The concerns with delayed cord clamping earlier uh, were whether it will increase polycythemia and jaundice, but with the updated systematic reviews, meta-analysis from multiple groups, and Cochrane has also been updating the meta-analysis. The increase in peak bilirubin level is around 15 micromoles per liter. So you know that uh, around 17 uh, micromoles corresponds to one milligram per deciliter. So if, uh, if we do delayed cord clamping, that improved hematocrit or hemoglobin is only going to translate into just below one milligram per deciliter increase in the serum bilirubin, which we can very well manage with phototherapy. But if you look at all the other important hemodynamic benefits, they are all irreplaceable with any other intervention. It also results in better hemodynamic stability. So you can see here in this graph, the, the block line represents the SVC flow or the cardiac output in those babies who had delayed cord clamping and the dotted line represents the babies with early cord clamping. So obviously the blood flow or cardiac output is better and the need for inotropes is lesser in preterm units who underwent delayed cord clamping. What about term units? So again, uh, this is um, um, the Cochrane review of all the studies. So I thought wherever you have meta-analysis, let me just show the meta-analysis so that you can have a summary of the evidence for you to recall and reproduce in the exams. So in term units, we obviously are not really looking at outcomes like IVH or NEC. 
But what are the other benefits we expect by doing delayed cord clamping? So when you delay cord clamping by at least one minute, the blood volume obviously is better even in term units. The average blood volume is 90 ml per kg compared to 70 ml per kg in early cord clamping group. This provides additional iron, around 40 to 50 milligram per kg of extra iron and the birth weight of the baby is going to be 100 grams higher. Uh, this is a statistically significant difference between the delayed cord clamping and the early cord clamping group. Higher neonatal hemoglobin levels uh, in the delayed cord clamping group and the difference is around 2.1 gram per deciliter. So babies who have had delayed cord clamping are going to have higher hemoglobin. Iron stores measured by serum ferritin levels are higher and how long are they going to be higher? The effect has been seen Initially, it was seen until around 10 weeks in studies and later they could demonstrate a significant improvement even until six months. There is an increased requirement for phototherapy as in the preterm population, but this is not a serious morbidity. So we know this is an important outcome even in term babies because iron deficiency has been linked with a lot of problems such as cognitive delay, uh, febrile seizures, um, so, a lot of uh, issues have been linked with iron deficiency, autistic spectrum disorders, etc. So, even in term neonates, especially in our country, which has such a large burden of iron deficiency anemia, up to around 60% in childhood, in infancy particularly, delayed cord clamping is definitely a promising intervention. So, this is a summary of all the important outcomes. In mothers, there is no difference uh, between delayed and early cord clamping. There is particularly no increase in the incidence of postpartum bleeding or use of eutrotonic agents like oxytocin. So it's, it's a safe intervention for mothers. Term neonates, we just saw the increase, the hemoglobin levels at birth are better by 2.1 gram percent in the delayed cord clamping arm. Higher iron levels or iron stores sustained until six months and it may potentially improve cognitive outcomes. Preterm neonates, there is a nearly 40% reduction in the need for transfusion, intraventricular bleed, and necrotizing enterocolitis. Are there long-term benefits? So one of the important studies which we must know in this domain is the Australian Placental Transfusion Study or APT study, which was one of the largest uh, studies uh, comparing um, uh, early versus delayed cord clamping. Early clamping was done at 10 seconds and delayed clamping at 60 seconds or longer. This study had long-term outcomes documented and they found that the uh, incidence of combined outcome of death and uh, major disability was lesser in the delayed cord clamping group, 29% versus 34% in the immediate clamping group. And this is uh, uh, associated with a statistical significance. So it means that there is a 17% relative reduction in the um, incidence of this outcome. So when you say RR of 0.83, it's that, that means there is a 17% relative risk reduction. And um, this can range from um, anything between 28% to 5%. So it is not crossing one, which means it is statistically significant. So this was published around two years back. The uh, next concept is um, the the use of early CPAP in the delivery room. Now, um, so this one, uh, again, you know from a lot of, uh, you, have, you must have gone through these uh, few landmark studies, the support coin and the delivery room uh, management study. Support was a United States based study. Coin uh, was from Australia. And the Vermont Oxford Network Delivery Room Management Study came from Europe. Now, all these studies essentially had with some variations in their uh, respective protocols. They looked at comparison of starting early CPAP in the, right from the delivery room in extremely preterm neonates versus a different strategy, which, were, which was one either only intubation and mechanical ventilation or intubation combined with routine surfactant administration in the other arm. The drm Vaughan study had, in fact, three arms. Now, to summarize the findings of these studies, you can see in these bars here, the percentage of newborns in these landmark studies who required intubation on your left and who required surfactant on your right. So, around 40 to 
60% of newborns in these respective studies ended up requiring surfactant administration in the CPAP arm. So these uh, bars only represent this requirement in the CPAP arm. So which means not all the neonates had to be intubated in any of these studies in the CPAP arm. And these were all only babies between 24 to around 26 weeks of gestational age. The COIN included 25 to 28 weeks. Support study, one gestational age, one week gestational age, lower, etc. So it, it showed that prophylactic CPAP or the use of early delivery room CPAP is still feasible and it brings down the incidence of mechanical ventilation and surfactant administration even in this gestational age. But there is a need to identify early CPAP failures and babies who may require resuscitation. So to summarize the, the recent trials in the delivery room resuscitation area, we have just seen the Indian studies that showed that endotracheal intubation and tracheal suctioning is not routinely required, even in non-vigorous neonates with MSL. Next, we saw that in preterm newborns, the role of sustained inflation is no longer recommended because of an increase in death in the SAIL study. Then we looked at evidence, recent studies that looked at cord management and for all vigorous term and preterm newborns, delayed cord clamping is recommended. Now cord milking as an alternative to delayed cord clamping is recommended in gestational ages above 29 weeks of gestational age because of a increased incidence of IVH in lower gestational ages. And finally, we saw that early CPAP can avoid the need for mechanical ventilation and surfactant as evidenced from the COIN support and the Vermont Oxford Network studies. Moving on next in the respiratory management, what have the recent studies shown us? So here we'll be discussing about the newer techniques of surfactant administration, particularly about LISA and MIST. So these two terms uh, came more and more in the last around 10 to 15 years. LISA standing for less invasive surfactant administration and MIST being minimally invasive surfactant administration. So prior to these studies, we traditionally were routinely giving surfactant with insure. Even now, uh, a lot of us give use insure. So it is no longer, not, not really obsolete that way. Insure is intubate, give surfactant through the endotracheal tube and extubate to CPAP. Although this was the norm, there was a, a felt need for some technique which could avoid the uh, complications of endotracheal intubation such as pain and the, um, the possible kind of interruption to CPAP when the endotracheal tube bypasses the glottis. So all these alternatives started coming in. So initially when uh, MIST or LISA as we know from different techniques came in, the advantages were that it could combine surfactant therapy in a spontaneously breathing baby without losing the natural peep or the natural peep that is generated by the closure of the glottis. So it maintains laryngeal function. And LISA has potential to improve patient comfort by avoiding mechanical ventilation. Uh, and we can we'll now see in some time how um, evidence has shown that LISA is beneficial. So these are all the different uh, uh, technical terms for uh, different types of uh, minimally invasive surfactant administration. Um, you, when it started with um, the Hobart method, which is here in the fourth row, the, the catheter that was used was a semi-rigid vascular catheter or an angiocat. So this included, so the, the operator would use laryngoscope to visualize the glottis and directly pass this vascular catheter and give surfactant through this. It did not need a forceps because the catheter was itself rigid. But people thought why use even this rigid catheter and then started trying the use of other flexible nasogastric tube or a flexible suction catheter, uh, which was even less traumatic to the baby. But because this may not directly um, negotiate into the glottis, this required the use of a magal forceps. And this was used in the study by Cribs, who was one of the proponents in this domain. So he brought in the concept of 
um, the um, Cologne method, where a Magnus forceps was used for directing this suction catheter into the baby's glottis. So here we have uh, a network meta-analysis, which uh, looked at different techniques of respiratory support. So it looked at almost seven different strategies of giving respiratory support and included more than um, around 30 trials. The population of babies was babies born preterm less than 33 weeks and who are all enrolled below 24 hours. And they looked at the primary outcome of death combined with bronchopulmonary dysplasia at 36 weeks of gestational age. So when they looked at which was the best strategy to reduce the incidence of the primary outcome, it was found that LISA occupied the first rank. So this uh, being a network meta-analysis, it involved direct as well as indirect comparisons between different arms. So different strategies were looked at. So one was LISA. They also had this traditional insure, intubate, surfactant, and extubate. Then using laryngeal mask airway for giving surfactant. Uh, mechanical ventilation and intubation itself was one arm. Nasal CPAP. Then they had nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation. Even nebulized surfactant was compared. So among all these different respiratory support strategy, it is, it, strategies, it was found that LISA occupied the, the first rank based on the highest surface under the cumulative ranking curve. So this is called a Sukra. Um, number you can see here is 0 0.94. So this was the best strategy for reducing combined outcome of death or BPD. The second rank in this particular network meta-analysis was occupied by NIPP. So this was occupying the second rank and Sukra for this was 0 0.66. Similar to Insure. Insure was a third rank. But there were a lot of problems in the uh, meta-analysis because um, obviously these studies using LISA were unblinded studies. So there could be potential bias. Sample sizes were small and there could be heterogeneity amongst the studies because each could have used different type of catheter and different type of uh, surfactant. Some could have used Curosurf. Some might have used uh, Neosurf. And there is also a problem that larger volume surfactant we can't give using these catheters usually because there is a lot of reflux. So this is this paper, Network Meta-Analysis by Isayama et al. Um, looking at various non-invasive ventilation strategies on and their effect on mortality and BPD. So this is one area that we all should read up and know. Now the other important domain is our understanding in the definitions of BPD itself. So BPD initially um, one used to uh, define as baby requiring oxygen for more than 28 days. But because this may result in overclassifying a lot of preterm babies to have BPD, this time cutoff moved gradually to 36 weeks of post-conceptional age. Later, um, NIH in 2001, they used this particular definition. This is the older de definition for classifying BPD. So once you know that a baby requiring more than 21% oxygen for at least 28 days qualifies to develop BPD, we then try to classify BPD at 36 weeks of PCA or discharge for a baby below 32 weeks or at 56 days of um, postnatal age or a discharge for a more mature baby more than 32 weeks. The classification done was mild, moderate and severe based on whether baby required no oxygen or less than 30% oxygen or either more than 30% or PEEP at the timing of classification. So during classification, if the baby doesn't need any oxygen, it becomes mild BPD, less than 30% moderate, more than 30% FiO2 or any PEEP requirement, either CPAP or ventilation, it becomes severe. This was the earlier classification. But in 2018, the BPD classification was revised by the NICHD. And this is what you can see here. So any premature baby born below 32 weeks with parenchymal changes of BPD, radiological changes, and if the baby persistently requires oxygen on three consecutive days to maintain normal arterial saturations. This is taken as the mandate for, um, for defining a baby to have BPD. And the grading is done as grade one, two, three, 
based on the type of respiratory support and the FIO2 requirements. So any baby who is ventilated at the type of at the time of um, this this assessment, uh, which is 36 weeks of post conceptual age, the baby is still ventilated. Then that it automatically becomes either grade two or three. It cannot be grade one. Ventilated baby with room air grade two more than uh, room air any oxygen requirement becomes grade three. Likewise, if the baby is on CPAP, NIPPV, that means any PEEP requirement or high flow nasal cannula more than three liters, then the classification is based on FIO2 as grade one, 21%, grade two is up to 30%, more than 30% is grade three. And if the baby is requiring lesser flow, one to three liters, it, it will fall into either grade one or two, up to 30% grade one and more than 30% grade two. And if the baby is requiring low flow nasal cannula below one liter, then 21 to 70% requirement is grade 1 and more than 70% oxygen requirement becomes grade 2. They also give a connotation as grade 3A to indicate those babies who had early death, that is, anytime after 2 weeks until the time of classification, which is 36 weeks post-conceptional age, owing to persistent parenchymal lung issue, which is not explainable due to other problems like NEC, IVH, or the baby going lama or dama or sepsis so this is used for epidemiological purposes to see whether the baby really has bpd so some questions for you all uh, you can just answer in the chat box based on what we have discussed and some things we are going to discuss ventilation strategy that results in reduced bpd so read the question carefully based on what we have seen so far which ventilation strategy reduces bpd Okay, so as per uh, the, the network meta-analysis that we just discussed, the right answer would be NIPPV. You are right, May some of you have answered volume guarantee. In different types, uh, in invasive ventilation, volume guarantee also is found to be associated with lesser risk of PPD. Okay, now which medication started immediately after birth is likely to reduce BPD? Caffeine. So, a surfactant may not be appropriate. We are talking about a medication. Now, any other medication other than caffeine? I completely agree. Caffeine is right. Has any steroid been, yes, evaluated for correct? So, hydrocord used in the, uh, as in the Premilog trial has also been found to reduce BPD. Now, hydrocord, we'll look into the evidence. One the early use of hydrocord has been associated with lesser incidence of BPD. Um, next question, which surfactant strategy results in reduction in BPD? Right. Less invasive surfactant strategy definitely has been shown to reduce BPD when compared to insure. Now, do we know if at all we are planning to use postnatal steroid in the treatment of BPD? At what risk of BPD, would you want to consider postnatal steroid? If at all you could predict, okay, this baby has this much percentage risk of developing BPD. What percentage risk would you want to start postnatal steroid? It's slightly difficult one. Okay, 60% is almost right. Okay, we'll look at this study as well. This is an important paper for us to know. It's 65% to be precise. And uh, anyone knows what's the common, uh, what is the common um, kind of regime of dexamethasone used? DART. Perfect. Right. So, and this includes dexamethasone. So, we'll discuss a little bit about this uh, uh, BPD and uh, treatment, especially steroids, um, for us to handle these newer uh, questions in exam. Okay, so these were all the answers. Medication, you all wrote caffeine. That is also perfectly right. Because we're discussing about postnatal steroids. Um, the answer given here is hydrocortisone, but it's perfectly right to uh, use caffeine as well. Now, the, the role of postnatal steroids in bronchopulmonary dysplasia prevention and treatment, there, there is a lot of newer research. Uh, most of you have uh, answered hydrocortisone correct. So this was uh, the study that um, gave rise to that, um, that particular concept, Premilog. 
So this study looked into prophylactic um, hydrocortisone in infants between 24 to uh, 27 plus 6 weeks of gestational age. So extremely preterm babies and um, a cumulative dose of 8.5 mg of hydrocortisone was used over 10 days postnatal life in this study. And what did we see in the study? Survival without BPD was, was better with the use of early hydrocortisone, but it came with a problem. There was higher incidence of sepsis, especially in the smaller gestational subset. 24 to 25 weekers in Premilog study had higher incidence of sepsis. So this is the reason why it has still not become a very standard practice. So this is uh, one important study that we should know, Premiloc. Now, um, we discussed about when to use postnatal steroid or when to consider or at what risk of BPD should be considered postnatal steroids because we know that they come with a lot of side effects. So this is one meta-regression study. So this is something like a systematic review and meta-analysis, but it is looking at risk stratification. This had 21 studies, uh, this particular meta-regression by Doyle in 2015 and 1,721 infants were randomized. So as you can see in this particular graph, so anything above this line is favoring control, which means do not give steroid. So at this risk of uh, BPD, if we give steroid, it is resulting in higher risk of death BPD. So this particular risk, risk meaning it is if anything below 35%, as you can see here from the x-axis, if, if that was the baseline risk of BPD, then in those babies, giving steroid only is bad. So this is where it kind of uh, crosses the line of null effect. So this is corresponding roughly to a risk of 35%. Whereas here, the point where this line again crosses this null effect, this corresponds to 65%. So here, beyond this particular risk of BPD, if you give cort corticosteroids, it favors your outcome, your effect on death or CP, which means if the BPD risk prediction is more than 65% in a baby, then giving steroids will actually reduce the risk of death or cerebral palsy. If not, BPD itself can increase the risk of death or cerebral palsy. So this risk stratification, if we can somehow predict the risk of BPD, we can use for deciding for whom we can use postnatal steroids. I hope that is clear. So it is based, it is right. Alicia has asked, is it based on BPD calculator? Yes, it is based on BPD calculator. Now, that brings us to the BPD calculator itself. So NICHD has come up with a online neonatal BPD risk calculator, which we all can access online. And these are all some of the parameters that we have to enter. Um, so it starts from the postnatal age. You only have few numbers there. We can't enter any postnatal age. You have things like, say, 7, 14, and 28, etc. So you'll have to enter roughly whether this baby is within first week or first to second week, etc. Then we enter the gestational age, birth weight, gender. Uh, if it is below day seven, then it asks you to enter antenatal steroid status. And um, if baby's postnatal age is between 14 to 28, then we have to enter whether the baby has surgical grade of NEC. Then we have to enter what support the baby is on. So I've just entered one example, a seven-day baby, 26-weeker, 900-gram male. Um, so obviously, this baby's... Um, um, you know, ANS steroid status was not asked because it is only relevant on day one. Um, surgical NEC is only relevant day 14 to day 28. Again, that was not asked. Baby is on CPAP and the FO2 requirement is 35%. So if you enter all this, it gives you the BPD risk for this baby. So the risk of this baby having no BPD is 37.5%. In other words, the risk of the baby developing BPD is 100 minus 37.5, which is around 62.5%. So this baby is just on the border for considering the use of postnatal steroid. So we saw that if the risk is more than 65%, we may think of PNS, postnatal steroid, because the benefit is better than the risk of CP. Whereas if the risk is well below 35%, then giving postnatal steroid will increase the risk of death or cerebral palsy. Hence, it should not be given in that group. Now, moving on, um, 
So early rescue, early rescue CPAP is likely to reduce what two outcomes we saw in the graph. Right? So can anyone tell it reduces the need for two things? Good. One is the need for intubation and mechanical ventilation. Great. The second thing is need for surfactant. Okay. BPD is a little bit more controversial. Um, not all studies consistently show reduction in BPD, especially when you compare early CPAP versus mechanical ventilation. There are some studies in favor of BPD reduction. For example, in COIN, there was no demonstrable reduction in the risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. But that, that, that should not discourage us from using early CPAP wherever possible. Next question, there is a dash-shaped relationship between um, PVR, that is pulmonary vascular resistance and lung volume. Yeah, parabolic or U-shaped, you could say, because both low as well as high long volume will be associated with high PVR. Yes, perfect. Among CPAP, NIMV, and HFNC, the best strategy to reduce mechanical ventilation while giving primary treatment for RDS is, yes, it is NIMV. Definitely, even primary NIMV has been shown to reduce the need for mechanical ventilation, although primary NIMV may not really translate into reduction in BPD, but definitely reduces the need for ventilation. Whereas NIMV, when used as post-extubation strategy, not only reduces need for ventilation, but also BPD. HFNC is as effective as CPAP in the primary treatment of preterm infants. Is this true or false? False. So HFNC is inferior to CPAP in primary treatment of RDS. It is as effective as CPAP in, in which scenario? In the treatment of preterm infant, infants for? Correct. As per hipster study, HFNC is inferior in RDS. But it is as effective as CPAP or non-inferior to CPAP in the post-extubation scenario. Excellent. For preterm infants below 26 weeks with RDS on CPAP, surfactant is recommended at what FiO2? Below 26 weeks. 30, 40. So 30 is what the European guideline recommend at babies for babies less than 36 weeks. Now, greater the gestational age of the baby, the FIO2 threshold becomes 40%. So, um, when it comes to the, the uh, you know, the recent trials or uh, recent updated research, postnatal steroids, this is where it stands. So, if, you, if someone asks you, um, uh, what is your um, consensus on the effect of postnatal steroids for bronchopulmonary dysplasia? Please classify it as early use and late use. So early is any use of PNS below 8 days, that is 0 to 7 days, and late is more than 8 days, that is beyond the first week. Now in both these modalities, uh, or both these timings, the use of postnatal steroid definitely reduces the incidence of BPD alone or the combination of death or BPD. This is seen both with early use as well as with late use. But early use of postnatal steroids is associated with more complications. You see hyperglycemia and hypertension in both the timings of postnatal steroid usage, but GI complications are more common, particularly GI perforation in early use of PNS. Obviously, the baby's gut is more immature at that time. Also, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is more common in early PNS use. And finally, um, the use of uh, early postnatal steroid is also associated with higher incidence of neurodevelopmental problems, such as cerebral palsy, death, and combination of death and abnormal neurological examination. So this is a little crowded slide, but um, so let's let's begin from this place: systemic postnatal steroids. So essentially. What we should understand is whether or not we use dexamethasone or hydrocortisone. You can look at the combined data here. Irrespective of the type of steroid, early use, less than seven days, does reduce the incidence of BPD. So 0.80 relative risk means 20% reduction in BPD. 
0.73 to 0.88 is a 95% CI. It's not crossing one, which means it is a significant, statistically significant reduction. Um, this is also true for the combined outcome of mortality or BPD. When you look at the individual steroids, it looks like hydrocortisone is actually a little better, especially when used early. Dexamethasone is also working. Hydrocortisone is also working. More than seven days or late steroid, when you first look at the combined, uh, uh, you know, late PNS effect, again, this reduces the outcome of death or BPD significantly. But you, if you see CP, more than seven days, it is not significantly increasing the risk because your RR goes from 95% CA is going from 0.8 to 1.6. It's crossing one, which means it is not significant. But look at early use. 1.43, 95% CA is 1.07 to 1.92. So what does it show? There is a significant increase or 43% increase in the risk of cerebral palsy. So this is the problem with early postnatal steroid. That's why we, we, if at all we have to use late postnatal steroid and that decision we are going to take in um, using the, um, the estimated risk of BPD in a given baby so if the baby is at high risk of BPD, like more than 65% from the calculator, um, or if say you have a baby who is clearly ventilator dependent, day 14, lung, lungs are suggestive of X-ray, chest is suggestive of BPD, we have ruled out all other factors like PD and sepsis, and we are thinking about steroid usage, we are only going to consider it late, that is more than seven days. We never think of steroids early, less than seven days. If at all early steroid, if at all we have um, if we have the inclination to use steroid early, then better to use hydrocortisone and not dexamethasone. Um, the this the toxicity might be lesser, um, and uh, the hydrocortisone is definitely not working when used late. But in general, definitely late PNS is giving you the right combination of efficacy as well as safety. This also has one um, uh, line on inhaled corticosteroids. So you can see here that inhaled corticosteroids in the first, uh, um, you know, relative risk here, 0 0.76 for BPD at 36 weeks and 95% CA is also significant. So when used less than 14 days, inhaled corticosteroids may also work in reduction of BPD as well as combined outcome of mortality and BPD. HFNC, you all rightly told me that um, uh, when used as a primary mode of support, like as soon as when the baby is born, when the baby develops respiratory distress, when you compare humidified high flow nasal cannula versus CPAP, all these landmark studies by Hipster, uh, Dr. Murki's study from India and Hunter et al., these three studies shown, showed that treatment failure is statistically significantly higher with the HFNC arm, which is indicated here in the blue arm. Um, and it's 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 seen in all these studies to be almost consistent at between 20 to 26 percent, whereas in the CPAP arm it was around 10 to 12 percent. So primary support HFNC is inferior to CPAP. Post extubation support or for apnea HFNC is equivalent to CPAP. NIMV versus CPAP. NIMV when used as primary mode reduces need for ventilation but may not necessarily reduce BPD. So if you have a high risk baby for extubation, for reintubation, like a extremely preterm, less than 28 week uh, baby with uh, poor respiratory drive, uh, you may consider using NIMB as a primary support, but routinely one doesn't have to use NIMB. And NIMB when used as post extubation support is definitely better than CPAP. It reduces the need for extubation failure. Then comes caffeine. I'm sure you all know about CAP trial. It, this is not really a recent trial. It came almost 18 years, uh, 19 years ago. Um, this was caffeine for apnea of prematurity trial, one of the best conducted trials in neonatology. Included 2006 newborn babies between 500 to 1,250 grams. And it was uh, published by Barbara Schmidt and group in NEGM. So um, now what is special about CAP, CAP trial is that it was an almost perfectly implemented trial, double-blinded, placebo-controlled, randomized-controlled trial. Um, and it showed significant reduction in these six important outcomes with caffeine. 
So they used a loading dose of 20 milligrams per kg of caffeine citrate followed by a maintenance dose of 5 to 10 milligrams per kg per day of caffeine when compared to a similar identical placebo. So um, the incidence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, severe ROP requiring treatment, medical management and surgical management for HSPDA, um, the combined outcome of death or disability at follow-up and cerebral palsy alone. All these outcomes, you can see here, they are all statistically significantly lower with caffeine. Not only the relative risks are less than one, but the 95% CA is also completely on the lower side of one. So these are all significant reduction. Um, the CAP trial has group has been coming up with their long-term data. So this initial publication that we just saw, which was published in NEJM, was the first publication which showed lesser BPD and lesser need for ventilation, oxygen, CPAP, everything. Uh, interestingly, they never had apnea as their outcome, one of their outcomes. They looked at so many other things like BPD and PDA, need for transfusion, but they never looked at apnea. Um, and uh, later they kept publishing their long-term outcome because they have been following up this cohort of 2006 babies very carefully. At 18 to 21 months, the caffeine group had improved survival without disability. This outcome, um, this uh, positive effect, however, was not sustained until five years, possibly because of uh, plasticity and uh, other factors. The control group also possibly improved by that time. At five years, there was no difference in the survival without disability. Later, two years later, they came up with a publication which showed that there is no difference in the sleep duration because uh, one of the problems that was anticipated with caffeine was an increased CNS excitability and irritability. So they wanted to see if this was affecting the long-term long sleep pattern of the baby, which it did not. And interestingly, again, at 11 years when they saw, there was improvement in some of the uh, outcomes, neurological outcomes like motor impairment, improved visual motor scales, visual perceptual scales, and visual spatial abilities in children who had received caffeine as preterm neonates. So caffeine is one is considered as a silver bullet um, drug in neonatology. It, it seems to work for so many conditions and um, no, uh, no wonder that despite the CAP trial not strongly recommending prophylactic caffeine, it has not deterred all of us in using caffeine prophylactically in the most immature babies. Most of us end up starting caffeine almost immediately after birth when we see a baby who is very preterm, like a baby who is say less than 30 weeks, less than 1200 grams, we always use caffeine. But when the CAP um, authors publish their uh, data or their study, they didn't really recommend using caffeine prophylactically. They only recommended caffeine after extubation or in a baby with apnea of prematurity. Now coming to oxygen saturation targeting, again, we have some questions. So what is the saturation target at five minutes for a preterm baby? Less than 28 weeks requiring resuscitation. So you all know that at first minute, the, the saturation target is only 60 to 65%. So what is it going to be at five minutes? Right, it is eight, 80 to 85%. Okay, 85 to 95% is reached only at 10 minutes. Stop ROP and boost one. So these were the, there were a lot of saturation targeting um, related RCTs. A uh, lot of name trials you have here, stop ROP, uh, boost one, boost two or neoprom. So these were randomized controlled trials which compared a certain saturation target versus another tar target. So initially with uh, stop ROP, the outcome was not really to look at um, BPD. It was actually done to see with whether the saturation target has any outcome in progression of ROP. So they, they did for a different reason actually. And their targets were also a little higher. So they look, looked at 96 to 99% in the higher arm. And in the lower arm, it was 91 to 95%. So they established that the higher target was actually quite bad because those babies had higher risk of ROP. So the, the high target, which was 96 to 99, was actually bad as seen by the stop ROP study. 
Later from uh, boost two onwards, the, the targets that were compared were, as you all said, 85 to 89 versus 91 to 95%. Because by the time they knew that 96 to 99 is, is, is pretty bad because it is associated with higher bronchopulmonary dysplasia and higher incidence of ROP. So no one was even ready to look at that saturation target. So after boost two, we realized that when compared to 85 to 89, 91 to 95 is actually a better target because um, which are the uh, outcomes which are, um, uh, which outcome is lower in 91 to 95% which makes us recommend this target? Correct. Death. So mortality is lower in the saturation target 91 to 95. Although ROP is actually higher in 91 to 95% saturation target. But ROP, you can still manage. But if, if the baby dies, then there's nothing we can do. So the current saturation uh, target that is recommended is 91 to 95%. And this comes from Boost 2 or Neoprom collaborative trials. So this Boost 2 or Neoprom is a very special type of meta-analysis. Can anyone tell what is special about this meta-analysis? You know that meta-analysis means they put combine few randomized controlled trials and then pool the outcomes. But what was special about these, uh, this new prom meta-analysis? Correct. This was a prospective meta-analysis in the sense that this group of investigators, they all plan to have identical protocol. So they said to, to avoid heterogeneity and confusion, we all will have similar study population, similar uh, intervention arm, similar control arm and look at same outcome, use the same pulse oximeter and have the same protocol across all the centers in order to boost the homogeneity and the, um, the uh, validity of this evidence. So based on the Neopro um, group of RCTs that came actually from five RCTs across different uh, continents, we know now that 91 to 95% saturation target is better than 85 to 89% because it is associated with lower mortality. However, we accept higher incidence of ROP. The third epidemic of ROP that we are seeing in India is, is because of increased... The answer is key. So what is it because of... Is it because of increased oxygen use or... Yes, it is because of increased survival of extreme preterms. And uh, we know that there are a lot of variations across the centers in the practices that are being used. So lower saturation target, that is 85 to 89% in this Neoprom or Boost 2 trial, what were the pro problems associated with it? It resulted in higher risk of It didn't result in increased ROP actually, no. It was actually decreased ROP. So two problems that we saw in the lower saturation target. One we know is higher mortality. What was the other problem? Yes, higher NEC. Okay, so those are the answers. So we have uh, to summarize in the respiratory care, we discussed about the uh, network meta-analysis, which looked at different non-invasive ventilatory strategies. And it found that LISA was associated with least incidence of BPD. Um, and uh, then we had um, um, studies on um, postnatal steroids and the newer definition of BPD. And we also look, looked at caffeine cap trial in detail including its long-term outcome. And uh, lastly, we have discussed about oxygen saturation targeting. So we have, um, I think, another 20, 25 minutes left. Um, newer studies on nutrition and feeding. So here we all need to know about the SIF trial. So in enteral nutrition, we know that ME is beneficial. Using human milk is uh, recommended. The most recommended type of milk is obviously mother's own milk followed by pasteurized human donor milk where milk banking is available, only then followed by formula milk. Again, um, when it comes to the benefits of human milk, irrespective of whether it's MOM or donor milk, NEC is lesser uh, with human milk. 
Pasteurized human donor milk uh, is associated with significant reduction in NEC as well as mortality when compared to formula milk. But when we use mother's own milk, the benefits are actually multiple, multiple times higher. So here there is not much of new evidence because this is a very well-established fact. Um, human milk banks are coming up in a bigger and bigger number across India. The areas where the research has come up is enteral feeding um, protocols where especially escalation of feeding. Now we are looking at studies recommending rapid escalation of feeding. And one important study here is the SIF trial. So SIF trial uh, is the speed of increment in feeding trial. Um, this was a RCT, well-conducted RCT, relatively recent one. Um, it looked at babies less than 32 weeks, less than 1,500 grams. So you can see here that um, almost 2,800 babies were randomized in the SIP trial. One group underwent rapid feeding, which was defined as 30 ml per kg per day. And the other group had slow feeding, which was increment by 18 ml per kg per day. So the daily increment would be 30 or 18 ml per kg per day in the two arms. And what did they see? The primary outcome in the SIF trial was actually uh, survival. I think they looked at survival at 24 months. There was no difference in this. But the incidence of late onset sepsis was uh, significantly lower in the faster increment group. I'll show you the table where it will be clearer. So this is the faster increment group, 1000, almost 1,400 babies, and this is a slow increment group. So you can see that um, NEC, there is no difference. 5% versus 5.6%. No difference in NEC. Even if you give faster increment of feeding, it doesn't increase NEC. But the time taken to reach full feeding volume was only 7 days in the fast increment group and 10 days in the slower increment group. And this was um, statistically significant. So when you have a quantitative variable like time to reach full feeds, then when we pool it, instead of using relative risk, what do we use? We use something called as mean difference. So this is the uh, mean difference, which, is, which means three days lower in the faster feeding group. And when this does not cross zero here, it means that it is statistically significant because mean difference of zero means there is no difference between the groups. So here it is minus 3.3 to minus 2.7. Likewise, the uh, total duration of TPN days was also significantly lower in the faster increment group. The interesting part about SIF trial was that it recruited a lot of babies who were extremely preterm and who were high risk for NEC, like extreme low birth weight, less than 1000 grams and babies with Doppler abnormalities. Most of the earlier feeding increment trials looked at more mature babies. So this was published in NEGM 2019. Later, uh, we had uh, some other Indian studies which looked at even more aggressive nutrition. This was the early total enteral feeding uh, study published from India, from LHMC. So here what they did is they, they went one step uh, faster, uh, higher, and they said for all stable preterm babies who did not have shock or who did not have doctor abnormalities between 28 to 30, 34 weeks. Of course, they did not take babies below 1,000 grams, below 28 weeks. And straight away, they started with full enteral feeding as per the day-wise requirement. So day 180, then day 200 ml per kg, every, completely was started on as enteral feeding. And on the other group, they started as like MEN 20 ml per kg on day one. Step by step, they increased by 20 to 30 ml per kg per day. And what they found was in the early total enteral feeding group, sepsis, both clinical sepsis and culture positive sepsis were very low. Likewise, NEC was also very low. So despite giving early total enteral feeding, actually the NEC incidence, you can see here in the table, it was very, very low when compared to the complete the conventional enteral feeding group. And uh, this was published in 2019. The average gestational age was 31 and 32 weeks in the two arms. This was an Indian study. Um, the other Indian study that looked at early aggressive enteral feeding was published by Moody et al. in 2019. They looked at slightly smaller babies when compared to Sushma Ma Nangya Ma'am's uh, study. Uh, this was uh, conducted in babies with birth weight between 750 to 1,250 grams. Of course, uh, the, the earlier group also has come up with one more study in lower gestational age group babies. Here, the average birth weight and uh, was 1,085 grams and 1,067 grams. 
in the uh, aggressive enteral um, regimen, which means again, total enteral feeding was started. And in the other group, conservative or regular feeding policy was started, like MEN was started and then hiked step by step. In this study, there was no real significant difference um, in mortality and sepsis, although um, all these outcomes were actually lower in the aggressive regimen, but they did not reach statistical significance. Um, however, uh, you can see that the time to reach full feeds was definitely lower with the early total enteral feeding group. So uh, what we have seen so far is the SIF trial, which showed that uh, increment of 30 ml per kg is safe in almost all the preterm babies, including extreme preterm babies. And then a couple of Indian studies, which showed that you could even start uh, complete enteral feeding in, in a clinically hemodynamically stable baby. Earlier, we saw more than 28 weeks. In, in the second study, even babies up to 750 grams were included. Of course, they were not babies with hemodynamic instability, shock, or um, worsening FiO2 requirement, respiratory support, or babies with Doppler abnormalities. So some more MCQs for you. Probiotics are uh, most useful in the redu reduction of which morbidity? Okay, so as of today, if someone asks this question, it is it is good to say three outcomes, NEC, mortality, and late onset sepsis. So earlier, we only saw studies showing reduction in NEC, but now you can say confidently all these three outcomes are lower with the use of probiotic, NEC, mortality, and sepsis. Now, which is the most studied organism among probiotics? Among lactobacilli also, the species is lactobacillus, Ramnosis, which is the most studied. The prebiotic present in human milk. Prebiotic is a non-digestible carbohydrate that promotes the growth of organisms. So which prebiotic has been extensively um, studied and this is sup supposed to be the third largest solid component in the human milk. So it is human milk oligosaccharides, HMOs. Cellular mediation of Inflammation for NEC occurs through which receptor? So you're right, it is tall like receptor 4, TL4, TLR4. Okay, dose dependent effect of mother's own milk is present on which Morbidities, neonatal morbidities. So this NEC and sepsis. So probiotics um, is a very favorite question um, in our all our exams. Uh, there are multiple updates in the reviews that are coming in. More and more RCTs are getting published. So as we discussed, there is significant reduction in NEC, mortality and sepsis. Now, we will go one step further and see in the in newer studies, have we got closer to identifying which strain is most useful? So, we, we know already that multi-strain probiotics, that is probiotics having combination of lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, or saccharomyces, rather than a single-strain probiotic, are definitely more effective in redu reducing NEC as well as mortality. And uh, if at all a single-strain probiotic is only available, um, the uh, the one that is uh, extensively studied is one lactobacillus and the other one is bifidobacterium brevi M16V, particularly from uh, the Australian group. So this is also very extensively studied. So, but in general, a multi-strain probiotic is definitely better in preventing all the morbidities. This is not again very recent, but Girish Deshpande's paper in 2011, you can all search for this you will find very beautiful recommendations, which were all based on evidence at that point of time, of course, um, which come with, you know, which species is to be used, what is the dose of organisms to be given. So he recommends 3 billion organisms per day, preferably given as a single dose. Then when do we start? Whenever the unit is ready for enteral feeding. Interestingly, if we don't reach minimal enteral feeding, even by the first seven days, uh, how useful probiotic would be is question mark because, you know, already by then altered micro, um, microbiosis could have set in. Recommended duration of last use and then whether to uh, stop the supplementation of probiotic during acute illnesses. 
All these are told. Now, this very recent paper published few months ago in 2023, Frontiers in Nutrition, um, was a very interesting paper that looked at species-specific data for different morbidities. So this is possibly one of the few papers that has come with exactly what species are to be used for preventing NEC, mortality, etc. And what they say is this combination of four organisms, Bifidobacterium longum, Bifidum infantis, and Lactobacillus acidophilus, is one combination that may reduce all the three outcomes of interest, mortality, sepsis, and NEC. But there's very, very less evidence, particularly with this probiotic combination, as you can understand, each study must have used different, different probiotics. So all this comes with a lot of uncertainty. And uh, uh, another interesting finding is that a single probiotic species of Bifidobacterium lactis may reduce the incidence of mortality as well as NEC. So if at all, we should use this combination of these four, the Bifidobacterium, three strains and uh, one Lactobacillus acidophilus, or if it has to be a single strain, it, sh it should be Bifidobacterium lactis, but this is apparently not available in India. So going on to the newer things in fortification, please read up the ESPAGAN 2022 guidelines uh, for macro and micronutrient intakes in preterm babies. Not very different from the previous 2010 recommendation. ESPAGAN, you will find giving higher carbohydrate and protein um, recommendation when compared to the American Academy of Pediatrics in general. So as of now, it stands at 115 to 140 kilocals per kg per day and protein is 3.5 to 4 gram per kg per day and ELBW at least 4.5 gram per kg per day. These are the revised, um, the newer micronutrient um, recommendations as per ESPAGAN 2022, vitamin A, D. The interesting thing is vitamin D, they say we should never cross 1000 IU. Um, this earlier vitamin D alone used to be IU per day. Now that has also been made IU per kg per day. So uh, even at maximal intakes, Unfortified breast milk cannot meet macro and micronutrient demands of the very low birth weight babies and uh, hence the need for fortification. So human milk fortification or multi-component fortification definitely improves short-term anthropometric uh, growth parameters in preterm babies who are fortified. Although this the difference is very minuscule, the average mean weight gain is 1.8 gram per kg per day higher in the uh, HMF fortified groups, a very small difference. Likewise, length and head circumference, 0.1 centimeter per week, 0 0.08 centimeter per week, which is more. But over a period of time, this will all result in a tangible difference in the overall short-term growth. But none of the studies so far with human milk fortification really could show any improvement in the long-term IQ or neurodevelopment of the baby. So these are recommendations from different bodies. Um, I will just let this, uh, you know, uh, be part of your extended reading. Now, the other concept in fortification, which is relatively new, is adjustable fortification. So we all do standard fortification, mostly, where we add one sachet to a standard quantity of milk. So one sachet to 25 ml of mother milk is what most of us know or do. This is based on the assumed uh, protein and carbohydrate content of mother's preterm milk. But there is a lot of variation, especially in breast milk protein. So in order to adjust for this, people have tried individualized fortification. One is this strategy of adjustable fortification, which aims to maintain the blood urea nitrogen at 10 to 16 milligram per de deciliter. So every week, the baby's BUN is checked. If the BUN level, which is a marker of protein accretion, if it's below 10 mg per deciliter, we increase the strength of fortification. So instead of using single strength, which means one sachet per 25 ml, you may start using 1.5 sachet per 25 ml. Still, if BUN is low, we may go up to two sachets per 25 ml with the slight uh, increase in the incidence of feeding intolerance, vomiting, hyperosmolarity related issues, etc. Uh, on the other hand, rarely so if BUN crosses 16 milligram per liter, we can cut down the strength of fortification. The other way of individualizing is targeted fortification by using a human milk analyzer. So we actually measure the macronutrient concentrations in human milk and then analyze it and calculate the strength of fortification. This new study from Ames, which was published in JAMA Pediatrics 2021, is something again 
uh, I felt that all of us should know. This study looked at adding human preterm formula as the fortifier. So instead of adding HMF sachet, they took preterm formula and they added one gram of preterm formula to 25 ml of milk. Just the same as HMF in terms of the strength, but the uh, instead of using HMF, preterm formula was used. So preterm formula was made into small sachets so that it could be easily added to milk. And they did not find any difference in the growth. So weight gain was comparable in both the groups. This was designed as a non-inferiority RCT. Length, um, head circumference, everything was similar. Um, extra uterine growth restriction at 40 weeks was also similar. The um, one thing which was um, different between the two arms was the number of episodes of feeding intolerance. So you can see here that with preterm formula fortification, the episodes of feeding intolerance per 1,000 patient days was 2 per 1,442. Here it's 12 per 1,775. So it seems that preterm formula was better tolerated as a fortifier. The other uh, area that is um, uh, being always studied is the feeding pattern in babies with abnormal Dopplers. Here we all should know about the ADEPT trial. Uh, this is the abnormal Doppler enteral prescription trial, ADEPT. So this study compared uh, early initiation of feeding at 24 to 48 hours versus delayed initiation of feeding at um, around 4 to 5 days in babies with who had abnormal Dopplers. And they found that the risk of NEC was similar in both the groups. So early feeding also could be promoted in babies with abnormal Dopplers. So, um, shall I just finish PDA and ROP? Or is it getting too late for all of you? Okay. So, I presume that all of you are okay to continue. Okay. Now, when it comes to the management of HSPDA, um, the kind of newer... Uh, um, understanding here is one is we have had a new network meta-analysis on different effective treatment protocols for treating PDA. Um, of course, the major uh, line of thinking has changed from very aggressive management of PDA, particularly in more immature newborns, like more than 29 weeks. Um, all the protocols now say that tolerate a PDA and only treat PDAs, which are definitely significant as um, defined by various criteria, not only echocardiographic, but also clinical criteria. But in babies who are less than 29 weeks, the approach still seems to be that of early screening and targeted management, even of a echocardiographically significant aptus, because this strategy has been found to lower the incidence of some outcomes, particularly pulmonary hemorrhage, severe brain injury, and also a trend towards lowering bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So uh, this is the network meta-analysis that was published in JAMA 2018. This looked at all possible permutations and combinations of drugs, indomethacin, high dose, low dose, ibuprofen, standard dose and high dose, paracetamol, IV, oral, all these versus placebo to look at the incidence of uh, closure of HSPDA and some other secondary outcomes. And they found similar to the network meta-analysis that we saw for non-invasive ventilatory strategies, where we found LISA was the best strategy. Here also they did a ranking and they found that high dose oral ibuprofen and not paracetamol was actually found to have the highest rank in terms of achieving efficacy. That is in terms of achieving PDA closure. And when we mean high dose, it means First dose is 15 to 20 mg per kg of brufen, followed by 7.5 to 10 mg per kg given 12 to 24 hourly. So this is almost twice of the standard dose. So this is one thing that we should know. This is Mitra et al's uh, network meta-analysis published in 2018. Big paper. And uh, then we have, um, uh, this is not very recent. This is Patrick McNamara's classification uh, of uh, a hemodynamically significant PDA based on different ductal characteristics. So here you will find um, each characteristic being used to classify the PDA as no PDA, small, moderate, and large PDA. So uh, not only based on the 
2D assessment of the size of the ductus, but based on various uh, parameters like the ductal velocity, um, based on a pulse wave Doppler at the pulmonary end, wherein larger the PDA, lesser will be the velocity. Um, then the velocity of flow within the left pulmonary artery, this is because of the duct itself. And um, measures of pulmonary overcirculation, where uh, one of the popular ones is the M-mode long axis parastinal view assessment of the LA-AVO ratio. So larger the LA-AVO ratio indicates more pulmonary overcirculation. Likewise, larger LVAO ratio also in indicates left heart dilatation because of pulmonary overcirculation. Transmitral EA ratio, again, more the ratio, it uh, represents pseudo normalization of the E by A ratio and represents a larger PDA. Yeah, and uh, systemic hypoperfusion, uh, we look at some measures here. Here, uh, the greater is the retrograde diastolic flow or reverse diastolic flow, more than 50% of the cycles, if we see retrograde diastolic flow in the continuous wave Doppler in descending iota, again, it indicates a HSPD. Now, moving on to ROP. Um, ROP, we, we understand that, uh, you know, whatever we are going to discuss, like beat, uh, ROP trial and rainbow trial, these are all some newer trials in ROP. But for discussing them, the fundamental concept is we should know that when the baby is born, the baby is uh, in the fetal atmosphere, the baby was in hyperoxia. Um, sorry, the baby is in relative hypoxia and hence there is relatively high levels of uh, vascular endothelial factor and other factors. So the fetus is hypoxic. So high levels of VEGF and there is the retinal vascularization is slowly maturing. Now, as soon as the baby is born, um, there is increased exposure to oxygen, hyperoxia, which abruptly cuts down the synthesis of VEGF. So this retinal vasculature, it kind of abruptly at a certain level and um, the um, the, the peripheral hypoxic retina actually becomes a source of vasoactive factors. So this starts producing VGF and angiopoietin and all these factors, which will lead to the proliferation of abnormal neovascularization, which is at higher risk of retinal uh, detachment and vitreous hemorrhage, which can, which eventually leads to visual issues, vision problems. Subsequently, VGF levels gradually reduce and the neovascularization reduces. So based on the stage, based on the location um, and based on the presence or absence of plus disease, we decide whether ROP requires treatment. Now what is new in ROP? Conventionally, whenever uh, one screens and detects ROP, the baby used to be given laser therapy. Now laser therapy is giving series of laser burns in the peripheral avascular retina, which is the source of VEGF. But what happens when you give laser therapy, the problem was the ongoing retinal vessels would just stop at the point where they would be because further VEGF production, we would be cutting down by giving laser. And this resulted in, in severe restriction of the visual field in these babies and also a higher risk of traction leading to myopia. So hence, more and more need was felt for the uh, trial of using VEGF antagonist or vascular endothelial growth factor antagonist being injected into the intravitreal space. So these are real images in a baby who underwent laser where here you can see that the, the retinal vessel growth actually stopped because of laser therapy subsequently when we saw the baby at 13 months. These white lines seen beyond the uh, area of laser is actually only the choroidal vessels. These are not the retinal vessels. But after intraventral bevacizumab therapy, which is VEGF antagonist, there is ongoing growth of the retinal vessels even later. So this was the level at which it had grown when VEGF uh, treatment was given. But even after that, we can see ongoing growth of retinal vessels. So this made this particular uh, VEGF antagonist treatment look attractive for uh, treating ROP in babies. So let's look at these two landmark trials, the BEAT ROP and the rainbow trial. Beat ROP trial looked at bevacizumab uh, to eliminate the angiogenic threat of ROP. So this was a RCT involving 150 babies. So in ROP trials, you will always see this word that they randomized 300 eyes. So these were 150 babies who are randomized to receive either bevacizumab intravitreal uh, injection 
So this was given at 0 0.625 milligram um, dose of bevacizumab intravitreally versus conventional laser. And this is what they found. So they looked at the outcome in the zone 1 as well as zone 2. You all know that zone 1 is more medially uh, located, centrally located. It is involving the macula. So in zone 1, um, what did they see? They saw that the uh, recurrence of uh, ROP was uh, significantly uh, lesser when we when they gave bevacizumab when compared to laser. So the blue lines represent bevacizumab, red lines, red bars represent laser. So no ROP was significantly more with bevacizumab and recurrence um, uh, of ROP in zone one uh, as well as uh, in, in one eye, in both eyes, both were significantly lesser when they used bevacizumab. So it seemed to be better in zone one ROP, but in zone two ROP, there was not much of difference. Um, so in, in this beat ROP study, the babies were um, sort of uh, followed up until around uh, 54 weeks of uh, gestation, post-conceptional age. Uh, whereas the other newer study is the rainbow trial, which had three arms. This looked at another uh, anti-VEGF antagonist, which is ranibizumab. Um, ranibizumab has a slightly different molecular property and weight when compared to the when compared to bevacizumab and also different T half. So ranibizumab was given one dose was 0.2 milligram in one arm. The other arm received 0.1 milligram intravitreally and third arm received laser. And what rainbow trial found was, um, this was a more recent trial by Stahl et al. in Lancet in uh, 2021. So they found that the success of treatment, let's show you this graph. So this the success, success of treatment, they defined as survival without active ROP and other unfavorable structural outcomes like uh, detachment and uh, need for alternative treatment modality or surgery, etc. So successful treatment achieved overall was best with ranibuzumab high dose, that is 0.2 milligram dose, 80% versus 75% with 0.1 NG and 66% with laser. This advantage was particularly profound in the more preterm babies, less than 25 weeks and 25 to 26 weeks. But there were some differences between these two studies, the BTROP and the uh, rainbow uh, ROP, rainbow study. The rainbow study included all forms of treatable ROP. So you know that type 1 ROP requires treatment. And what is type 1 ROP? It is any ROP associated with plus disease in zone 1 or stage 3 and beyond if the baby is having zone 1 disease. Likewise, they, they define ROP requiring treatment in zone 2. So this rainbow study included all treatable type 1 ROP apart from the zone 2 stage 2 plus disease. Whereas BTROP only included a particular stage, which is stage 3 with plus disease in zone 1 and posterior zone 2. So it was a more restricted or limited trial and the follow-up duration was also longer with the uh, rainbow trial. So taking all these things into consideration, the NNF-CPG guideline on ROP has come up with this analysis. So what they say is when you compare laser arm here and uh, anti vegf therapy here, the um, the presence of you know unfavorable outcomes uh, is almost the same with both treatment modalities, particularly when you compare zone 1 and zone 2. When we look at only zone 1, from the B-ROP trial, definitely VEGF antagonists seem to have some advantage. But when we compare zone 1, when we combine zone 1 and zone 2, they fare nearly the same when it comes to the bad structural outcomes in a baby suffering from ROP. So there's not much of difference. But what is better is the incidence of high myopia and refractive error is significantly lower, 25 per 1,000 with the anti vegf group and it is 416 per 1,000 in the cryo or laser group. So definitely the long-term problems like refractive error, myopia, these seem to be lesser with, with the vegf antagonist group. So to, to take home a carry home message for all of us, intravitreal bevacizumab or ramizumab, when we use this, it reduces the risk of refractive errors during the childhood. But when it comes to the uh, risk of uh, retinal detachment or recurrence of ROP, um, it, is, it is almost the same as that of laser when we com combine zone 1 ROP and zone 2 ROP. However, if the baby has problem in zone 1 ROP, if, if you are doing ROP assessment and you find that your baby has zone 1 disease, 
you may consider using wedge of antagonist because in this group, the intervention may also reduce the risk of recurrence and it also gives the benefit of lesser refractive errors during childhood. Um, there is also a newer wedge of antagonist. Uh, apart from ranimizumab and um, bevazizumab. So does anybody know the name of another wedge of antagonist? This something called um, um, aflibercept, A-F-L-I-B-R-C-E-P-T. I'm sorry, I wanted to do this class with a pen, but my writing pen is not writing. Um, so aflibercept is the name of the other wedge of antagonist, which is also being evaluated now, in addition to bevazizumab and ranibizumab. And there is intravitreal pegaptinib, pegaptinib, which is used in conjunction with laser to reduce the risk of retinal detachment. In perinatology, um, asteroid is one study that has looked at maternal intramuscular dexa versus beta. And um, you know that dexamethasone, betamethasone, both are used as antenatal steroids, but because betamethasone sulfate plus phosphate combination is unavailable in India, the government of India is recommending dexamethasone. So this is one study, an international study that looked at comparison of these two. And as expected, there was no difference between IM dexa and beta on the neonatal outcomes. Metanol hypertension was more with betamethasone and uh, cesarean rate was also more with betamethasone. So only metanol outcomes were different in the asteroid trial. Uh, a very important trial in the perinatal domain for us is aspirin trial. Now, aspirin, um, as the name implies, was uh, um, a trial which looked at aspirin for prevention of prematurity in nulliparous uh, women. So this study looked at low-dose aspirin. They gave 81 milligram of aspirin daily, not in mothers with any risk factor. They just gave it for primiparous women who did not really have risk factors for PIH or who had established PIH or chronic hypertension or anything of that nature. These were all perfectly healthy nulliparous women and they started it very early between six weeks, six plus zero weeks to 13 plus six weeks in pregnancy. After they confirmed that this is a sing that that's a viable uh, pregnancy, um, they included only singletons. So, um, in this uh, healthy, low-risk population itself, this study found that there was a 11% relative risk reduction for prematurity. So aspirin supplementation for pregnancy indicated risk reduction in nulliparous trial. This is the expansion of aspirin. So this has a tremendous potential for reducing prematurity and um, you know may, may eventually make neonatologists uh, actually devoid of enough work also. Other interventions to reduce preterm births Progesterone is, is an upcoming intervention. So please read this aspirin trial. The full text will be available for you. Um, so this is the incidence of preterm delivery because this is a very large study. The actual incidences of preterm birth, uh, they don't look very different, 11.6 and 13.1%. But because of the huge sample size, this uh, p-value uh, is statistically significant. Relative risk is 0 0.89, 0 0.81 to 0.98 is the 95% CI. Um, progesterone is uh, another upcoming very promising modality. Um, vaginal progesterone especially has been shown to reduce premature birth in women below 34 weeks. Um, and um, this acts by reducing the gap junction formation. It is an oxytocin antagonist. It causes relaxation of smooth muscle, etc. It is not effective in twin pregnancies. Um, this is one uh, important uh, sort of uh, thing to note. It, it only works with singleton uh, pregnancies at high risk for preterm labor. labor. Uh, the other uh, intervention that has uh, been evaluated is cervical encirclage for preventing premature labor. Now again, this works only in singleton pregnancies with short cervix, especially cervical length less than 10 mm. Um, and when other tocolytics or antibiotics are being used as additional uh, therapy, this needs further evaluation. So if you have two factors, a woman with a short cervix, short cervix per se is defined as less than 2.5 centimeters. But if it is as low as less than 10 mm, then definitely cervical encephalage is effective. And the woman also having history of previous preterm birth. If both these factors are present in the present pregnancy, so obviously this is the second pregnancy or beyond, only then cervical encephalage is found to be 
effective in preventing preterm births. Neurology, um, some questions for all of us. What sign on MRA is an important our predictor of long-term outcome? So I'll tell the answer because I think it's already late. Plick sign. Yeah, plick sign is right. So the loss of uh, abnormal sing signal intensity in the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Uh, this you all know, so I'll just skip it. Therapeutic hypothermia, it's not new for us. So it is recommended in uh, moderate to severe encephalopathy, not in mild encephalopathy, and it reduces mortality and NDI if given within six hours of birth and for a duration of 72 hours. And the target temperature is 33 to 34 degrees. You can also say 33.5 plus or minus 5 degrees. Yes. Now, what are the MRS markers of core outcome in HIE? Magnetic resonance spectrometry markers. So, what are the markers? Is it lactate peak? Yes, lactate peak is one of the markers, but the most um, sensitive and specific marker is lactate by NAA ratio. So, lactate by N acetyl aspartate ratio is found to be the best MRS marker. Now, uh, we all know therapeutic hypothermia, there are controversies in low middle income countries, but still it reduces the incidence of death and severe disability by around a third, by around 35%. But there is now more and more research to look for uh, add-on adjunct to improve the outcomes in HIE. So which are all some of these add-on therapies to therapeutic hypothermia? Yes, excellent. Erythropoietin is one of the most studied drugs. The other drugs are inhalational xenon, gas. Next one is false. Levitrostam is not really recommended as the effective first-line therapy. Okay, and the effect, the criteria by AC Boji, I think I'll just leave it there. Right, so therapeutic hypothermia and LMIC, um, this is a very controversial study. There were a lot of um, critical Papers written when this study got published. This is the Helix study by Sudin Tail and his group. It was published in Lancet Global Health in 2021. Um, because a lot of Indian neonatologists felt that it put Indian um, uh, practices in very poor light. So it, it, it um, kind of provoked a lot of controversy. Uh, so this study um, kind of uh, um, used, uh, I mean, um, was conducted across... Uh, uh, three, cent three countries, India, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh, and seven tertiary care NICUs were included. The um, babies more than 36 weeks with moderate to severe HIE were included. Um, if they had APGAR scores of less than six at five minutes, they did not use blood gas criteria because of the pragmatic or practical reasons. They said most of the units may not have an immediate cord blood gas, so let's not use it. So they recruited 408 babies and the, these babies were randomized to receive either servo-controlled uh, whole body cooling or the traditional conventional care. And what they found was the blue group is the hypothermia group and the, the red bar represents the control group. So the incidence of both combined death and disability uh, as well as death alone was higher in the cooled group. This was not statistically significant, combined death and neuromorbidity, but death alone reached statistical significance. So um, the, the authors recommended strongly against therapeutic hypothermia in low and middle income countries. But um, there were some uh, issues with the study. Because they did not have blood gas criteria, it was felt that probably a lot of babies came with um, um, kind of uh, delayed um, you know, presentation. They included 70% outborn babies. So possibly a lot of these babies did not really have uh, acute hypoxia and uh, prolonged partial hypoxia is what um, the people who uh, who read it felt. And uh, hypothermia mediated uh, liver decompensation also was felt to be one of the reasons for increased mortality. Um, and this was substantiated by MRA findings in this in the study. The study also did MRA for the recruited babies. And most of the, the commonest type of MRA abnormality was periventricular white matter injury, which we generally see with chronic hypoxia that we see in preterm babies. Whereas in term asphyxiated babies, such as these babies, we would have expected basal ganglia changes and thalamic changes, which we did not find in Helix study. So with all these um, 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 kind of you know, different arguments, it was felt that Helix study 
eventually could have uh, looked at babies who had partial and prolonged hypoxia and not acute hypoxia, which was the reason possibly that the babies didn't benefit from therapeutic hypothermia. Otherwise, nothing much in therapeutic hypothermia. Erythropoietin, you all already said um, that this is one of the newer areas of research. I think um, I, I will not go into the details. Um, once again, I acknowledge and thank Deepak sir for sharing these slides. These were all slides shared by sir. So you can see that there are a number of studies looked at erythropoietin alone or erythropoietin in combination with hypothermia in birth asphyxia showing promising results in the long-term benefits. One other important newer trial is the NeoLev2. This is a study that compared phenobarbitone versus levetiracetam in treating neonatal seizures. And although levetiracetam is already a very, um, you know, preferred offhand drug that is used by all of us for treating seizures, this study actually showed that cessation of seizures was much better with phenobarbitone when compared to levetiracetam. 80% cessation with phenobarbitone and only 28% with levetiracetam. Pretty surprising um, study, which showed that levetiracetam fared much worse than phenobarbitone as the first line AED anti-epileptic drug. So this um, kind of um, uh, uh, made a lot of guidelines, uh, including the recent uh, NNF CPG guideline, Indian guideline, and this International League Against Epilepsy guideline continue to recommend phenobarbitone as the first line anti-seizure medication in newborns. The other important miscellaneous things, um, uh, trials, is uh, you must know the PLANET trial, which looked at platelet transfusion thresholds. It compared transfusing platelets um, in uh, at a count of below 50,000 versus 25,000. And uh, interestingly, it found that the babies who received transfusion at the lower threshold, lower threshold means below 25,000, they had lesser bleeding than babies who had transfusion at the higher threshold. So this is contrary to our understanding. We think that platelet transfusion will prevent bleeding. So giving at 50,000, uh, below 50,000 might prevent, might have prevented bleeding. But actually, those babies had a 26% chance of a major bleed when compared to only 19% in babies who were transfused below 25,000. So this and uh, there were some other adverse effects that were noted with um, the uh, more liberal transfusion arm. Survival with the BPD was also higher in babies who were transfused at a count of 50,000. So it was thought, this, the authors um, thought, felt that platelet transfusion may lead to fluid overload and that could have increased the chance of the baby developing BPD. This was the IKMC study. I think my animation is not working. So the IKMC is an important uh, study published in 2021, immediate KMC study. So this study looked at KMC started in preterm babies between 1 to 1.5 kgs in less than two hours of life when compared to standard KMC, which was started at around 24 hours of life. And they found that uh, by doing IKMC, the mortality was much lower in the enrolled population. So for doing immediate KMC, they established um, mother's maternal NICUs. So the mother was also given a bed in the NICU. So this required a drastic change in the plan of NICUs. India was one of the centers for the IKMC WHO trial, apart from other countries like Ghana, Nigeria, and Tanzania. And um, in India, uh, Saftarjung Hospital participated in the study. Um, so it was believed that doing IKMC uh, resulted in earlier breastfeeding establishment and res lesser risk of infections and better establishment of maternal microbiome in babies leading to lesser mortality. The last study for the day is the, fam the study of uh, family-centric care, was, which was uh, published in uh, Lancet, which was a clustered, uh, cluster RCT. So it looked at um, um, these 26 tertiary NICUs from Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, including preterm babies below 34 weeks, um, who were relatively stable and who had either no or very low level of respiratory support required. So in the family-centered uh, intensive care group, the parents had to be present for at least six hours a day. They had to attend educational sessions and actively care for their infant, whereas the traditional care by the healthcare providers was given in the the traditional group and the primary outcome was weight gain on day 21. Uh, this study showed that uh, the family-centered care resulted in better weight gain as evidenced by better Z scores on uh, at uh, day 21. 
which was their primary outcome. And these were all some of the interventions that the um, uh, the Indian studies from family-centered care advocated. So these are all things that parents could do as a part of family-centered care, like hand washing, um, covering the eyes and genitals during phototherapy for the baby, checking the warmer and pulse oximeter probe, checking IV candle site and recognition and reporting of danger signs as well as OG and oral feeding. So that's it from my end and um, I'm sorry for overshooting time. Are there any pressing questions?